Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 237, Story or Die, an interview with Lisa Cron, coming to you on Thursday, March 4th, 2021. Lisa has a new book out. It's actually called Story or Die. Uh, she's got a great story behind uh, why that is even the title. Um, and there is so much great information here that I am going to have a short introduction so that we can just have a nice long interview and I don't have to think about cutting anything. You don't want to take away from all of the great information that she has about storytelling and emotion versus logic and uh, the misbeliefs that we have and finding the misbeliefs that our target audience has so we can better understand how to sell them a product, understand them, just have empathy for our neighbor even. So is a great interview. You're going to love it. As always, Lisa is always a wonderful person to talk to about um, storytelling and story in general. So I will just remind you that if you're interested in the Finish Your Book membership group, or particularly if you're interested in the one-on-one -on -one coaching that I do, please go ahead and check out the information at rightnowworkshop.com forward slash writing coach, or send me an email at kitty at kittybuholtz.com. And I will be sure to get back to you right away and give you more information. Also, you can download a free self-publish your book checklist on the website. So that is three pages of all the information that you would need uh, to come up with before you start the process of going to a website to upload your book to put it for sale. So lots of information there. And keep in mind, the transcripts are on the show notes page now. Yay. Thank you, Angle. So appreciate you. So go to podcast rightnowworkshop.com forward slash episodes and search for the episode that you're looking for so that you can read the transcript. This one again is episode 237. And uh, that is it for the short list of announcements so that we can go ahead and listen to Lisa. Here we go. Today's guest is Lisa Cron. Lisa is the author of Wired for Story, Story Genius, and just this week her new book came out, Story or Die. How to Use Brain Science to Engage, Persuade, and Change Minds in Business and in Life. Lisa has worked in publishing at W.W. W. Norton and John Muir P Publications as an agent at the Angela Rinaldi Literary Agency, as a producer on shows for Showtime and Court TV, and as a story consultant for Warner Brothers and the William Morris Agency. Since 2006, she's been an instructor in the UCLA Extension Writers Program, and she has been on the faculty of the School of Visual Arts MFA Program in Visual Narrative in New York City. Lisa is a frequent speaker at writing workshops, universities, and schools, and in her work as a story coach, she helps writers, journalists, educators, business leaders, social justice advocates, and change makers master the unparalleled power of story. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. I love having you on the show. We always have so much fun because both of us love talking about story and particularly in the direction that you usually come from it, which is something having to do with brains and how our brains work. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Story is the language of the brain, so it makes total sense. Right. Oh, I just love you. We're going to be friends forever. <laughs> <laughs> so you were just on the show on December 31st, actually. And because it was kind of my post nano, let's talk about like, what do we do with the mess that we just made in November? Uh, I, <laughs> I didn't even ask you, but I titled your episode, how not to write a story. <laughs> That's attention getting. I like that. I thought people might enjoy that. And your two books, um, both of which I have and love, Wired for Story and Story Genius, as far as I can tell reading them, um, they're aimed at novelists, screenwriters, people who are telling, uh, for the most part, a fictional story. But that's not necessarily what Story or Die is about, is it? No, because that's not what story is. I mean, no, Story or Die is it takes it, I want to say deeper, but the truth is, both in Wired for Story and Story Genius, it goes to the same place because in, as they used to say in college, right? In literature as in life, stories are about how we make sense of things. And so what I'm fond of saying to writers is, is that that's what we come to story for. We don't come to story for what happens, a rip roaring plot or, or you know, objectively dramatic, you know, objectively dramatic events, because believe it or not, the notion of objectively dramatic is actually an oxymoron. 
because if it's objective, it can't be dramatic because it's only dramatic based on how it's affecting somebody subjectively in terms of what it means to them in that moment. And not just in that moment in the sense of, you know, they're walking down the street and suddenly, you know, there's an earthquake and they might, you know, perish because g generically we know nobody wants to perish anyway, let alone in an earthquake, but it's what it means to them in that moment, given what they wanted, given what they're doing, how it affects their plan and their sense of self in terms of, of literally their life story and what their agenda is in the moment. And the same is true in, in any story, whether it's you know a novel, a memoir, a movie, or a story that you're telling you know around the water cooler or what happened over Thanksgiving or about what happened during whatever election cycle <laughs> you might be in wherever you are. I mean, it's all story and it, it comes down to, as I'm fond of saying in terms of, uh, of writing, when I talk about the narrative thread and people go, well, in a novel or sorry, what's the narrative thread? And they mistake it for the plot. And the narrative thread is in fact, the evolving internal narrative that your protagonist is using to make sense of what's going on as they try to achieve their agenda without being vulnerable or giving things away in the process. And that's the way we as humans <laughs> act every minute of every day. So this book goes, it goes in, in the beginning and, and it was sort of my goal was, and I'm sorry about those dings. This is my husband's computer and I have no idea why we'll just ignore them. Stop it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I realize it's going to keep doing it. And I can't even read what it says because without my, my, without my computer, right. not, I know. So I apologize for that. We'll just uh, all ignore it. <laughs> yeah. Because if I turn the sound off, you wouldn't be able to hear me. So that would be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Figure that's the least of it. But, but with all of it, it's going into the brain science. And now what this book is about is how to apply those same principles to life because they are the principles that we are operating on every minute of every day, whether we know it or not. The way that we make sense of things is literally through story. And by that, I mean, you're the protagonist in your life story and everything that happens to you, every fact that's thrown at you, you don't look at that fact, quote unquote, objectively because facts have no meaning objectively. They only have a meaning boots on the ground in terms of how they are going to affect you giving your agenda. So everything that you see that you do, every fact that is pitched at you you, you, you evaluate that based on how is this going to affect me given my agenda? Is this going to help me? Is this going to hurt me? And that's how we make sense of everything. And it, it literally, the brain science flies in the face of almost everything that we have been taught about how we make decisions and why we make decisions. And that doesn't make us bad or dumb or stupid or stubborn it's what makes us human and the problem is we've been sold a way of looking at things that just isn't literally isn't true it's not we're not talking theory we're not talking ideology we're we're literally talking biology and now that we have a much better understanding of how we process information and why so much of what we've taught just literally goes out the window. And I think, I think a lot of us have seen kind of boots on the ground, the fact that, that a lot of what we've been taught isn't true because if you look at the world right now, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm in California, so I'm in the US, right? I assume a lot of you are too. And you know, no matter which side of the divide you're on, you know, when you look at a particular fact, and let's just pretend at this moment that we can even agree on <laughs> On, the, on, a, on, on any one particular fact, people from both sides are coming at it and reading vastly different meaning into it. And if you've got some notion of a, of a, of a, of a fact, and if I could give just one outlandish that, that I, would, I would hope, and I, I'll just say, I, I would hope that all of us would agree on this, that there's no, no actual real possible chance that those wildfires in California two years ago were caused by space lasers that were aimed and started the fires on purpose, you know, <laughs> by Jewish billionaires. I mean, it literally makes no factual sense, even physically. And yet you give people the facts about how that's like literally physically impossible besides there's no why behind it. And it's not gonna matter. They're not gonna look at the fact and go, 
well, let me, let, let me look at that aerodynamically. Like, could that actually be a thing that could actually really physically happen? Or, or the notion of Pizzagate and the notion that Hillary Clinton was running a pedophile ring out of a basement in a, in a pizza parlor in DC that didn't have a basement. So you'd think that the fact that it didn't have a, talk about a provable fact would make people go, oh, okay, got it. Somebody's making that up. Yeah. And yet it didn't. And yeah. that's because we don't look at facts objectively as facts. We look at facts as something very, very different. They're interpreted, the part of our brain that they wake up, the way that we see these things is massively different than how we've been taught that we look at it. And the problem is, the irony is, is that for us, we're the same way, all of us. You know, if someone gives us a fact, no matter what you believe, if someone gave you a fact that, that you know, counterdict, that contradicted it, the first thing you do is start to argue and figure out why that wasn't true, as opposed to, to take it in and think about it. And again, it's not because you're stubborn or stupid or closed closed-minded, it's because that's the way our brains work. And the problem then when we're trying to convince someone of something is because we don't know that, we tend to tacitly assume that what we believe is what everybody believes. And yeah. the argument that would us over to something would have the same meaning to everybody else. So when we give them those facts, we're assuming they're reading all of the same meaning in that we are, and they're not. And yeah. <laughs> because their story, in the context of their story, they have a very different interpretation of it. Yeah. And until we learn how the brain works and really embrace that, which is a fact, it's very difficult to understand why we do what we do, let alone why other people do. And it's very easy to vilify other people and get angry at them and think they're dumb or stupid or, you know, or closed minded when actually it's just biology and understanding the biology. I think the goal of that is, is to give us empathy for them and empathy for ourselves to understand more why we do what we do. And when it's a case of really wanting to change someone's mind about something, whether it's, you know, some sort of conspiracy theory that is down a very deep rabbit hole, like some of those are, or just, you know, buy my product or, or, you know, support my cause or vote for my candidate or trying to get your kid not to text and drive at the same time. It, you really have to understand the why behind why they're doing what they're doing to begin with, yeah. not just understanding it logically, but being able to feel it, being able to really feel and experience that deep seated why and where that came from. Because once you understand that, it's the only way that you then know what's standing in their way of actually hearing what you're saying. And that way you can come up with a story that can perhaps counter that. Yeah. And yeah. that's the goal of this book is both empathy. And also, as I think we're gonna talk about a little bit later, the role that emotion plays in all of this, because emotion is something that talk about, Talk about we've been handed a bill of goods that could not be more wrong in terms of emotion versus you know rational rationality or logic. That is just something that we are diamet. What we believe is just the opposite of what is true, yeah. and that you know the other part that keeps us wanting to logically explain something, and it just it's not going to do any good. It's yeah. Not decisions. And in the past, when you and I have talked and I've heard you uh, talk other places too, besides my podcast, um, there have been times when you've um, created a scenario that's just very, very simple so that people really understand. Um, so uh, when you were telling me about the, the title, you know, story or die, like if we didn't learn to tell stories, then we would have all died off a lot sooner from being eaten by saber toothed tigers or eating the poison berries. Right. So, um, one of the things I was thinking of when you were talking about empathy and stuff and understanding the other person, I was thinking about, you know, this um, nomadic tribe, saber tooth tigers, fro uh, um, poisonous berries, but also those moments. Like we had a moment this summer in Sweden, uh, the part of Sweden that I live in, where I don't know what happened, but black berry bushes just seem to grow up overnight filled with just thousands and thousands of blackberries. And at first I was like, oh my gosh, you guys, let's all go out. But then 
the closer that we got to, there were fewer blackberries and there was still some summer left and I hadn't made that pie or that cobbler. I'd been using the berries for other things. I was like, no, I don't know where there's any blackberry bushes. Like I'm totally lying, you know, or, oh, I don't think that that's a good place to get back blackberries because of blah, blah, blah. And obviously I have my reasons for lying because I want blackberries. It's not that I don't want you to have them. I just don't want you to have them if it means that I can't have them. And I'm thinking that some of this um, storytelling, I mean, lying is a form of storytelling. <laughs> Indeed. And so understanding why people say and do the things that they do. And you've got some great examples. I love the examples that you chose uh, in your book. Um, one of them was a soccer team in South America, the always uh, commercial that came on during the Super Bowl. So tell us a little bit more about, um, and I remember being in business school and everything was about logic and all the female students, you know, were 18 or 20 years old being told, you know, never show any emotion at work or you'll never get promoted. Um, you know, it was all about supposedly about logic. And now, you know, we are realizing that's, that's actually not how we convince people to follow us in business or in life. Exactly. No, it, it's a hundred percent. So there are two things we could talk about there. Tell me which to do first. One would be just to go into one of those two stories. The other would be to really talk about first why <laughs> the difference between emotion and logic and why that is completely untrue. Yeah, let's start um, there. Okay, so let's let's start with that and let's start with sort of the notion of what all of us have been taught. <laughs> and what all of us have been taught, and I know I was taught this, that you want to make any decision, right? So a decision. So either you're making a decision for yourself or you know, you're trying to get somebody else to make a different decision, is you're going to marshal all the facts, all the figures, all the data. <laughs> And you can analyze it, you know, in the cold light of objective reason. <laughs> and while you do that, what all of us were told, I think, is that you want to keep emotion at bay because emotion is that irascible scamp and it's going to tiptoe in and it's going to cloud your judgment and you're going to make a decision that you're going to, you know, wake up in the morning and completely, you know, rue that fact. And, and that's a great model. It's an absolutely great model. I mean, how many times have you been told that, you know, that, that it's your, it's your analytic brain, it's being analytical that makes you the master of your own ship. It's a, it's a great model because it makes us feel so safe. It yes. makes us feel so secure. It's a great model. It just turns out not to be true. You don't make any decision based on your rational analysis of the situation. You make a decision based on how that rational analysis makes you feel. It all comes back to feeling. And I don't know if we've gone in, on the show before into the, the, uh, the Antonio Damasio story, but I'd like to do that, that now okay. because Antonio Damasio was a, is a neuroscientist. He's written several books and he frequently writes about a patient he had, a man by the name of Elliot. And Elliot was one of those guys, I mean, he had, he, you know, he had a great job, he was high up in what he did, he had a great family, he was a pillar of his community. But sadly, he also had a brain tumor. Now, happily, it turned out to be benign and they were able to remove it. But in going in, they also had to get it out, they had to take out of some of his prefrontal cortex. And, you know, the operate, it was like the operation was success, success, but the patient literally became someone else. When he recovered, suddenly he, he wasn't himself anymore. And, you know, he'd go into his office and he would he'd go into his office and he'd try to figure out if he should do the thing that his boss had asked him to do. Or should he re-alphabetize his file folders again today? And if he was going to re-alphabetize his file folders, should he use the blue pen or the black pen? <laughs> you know, when he'd go to lunch, he'd go to, from restaurant to restaurant looking at menus, but he didn't know where to go in because he didn't know what he felt like eating. And that is what Damasio discovered. He did a large battery of tests. And what he discovered was that, was that Elliot had lost the ability to feel and process emotion. Keep in mind, he was still in the 97th percentile in intelligence. With all of those decisions he had to make, he could enumerate any possible scenario. He just had no ability to pick one. That's why he didn't know blue pen, black pen, what my boss wants me to do, or, or the file folders, what do I want for? I mean, imagine if you couldn't feel anything about anything. It's really, 
terrifying. I mean, um, if you couldn't feel anything about anything, imagine, imagine now that feeling that you get when you walk into a room and your beloved walks in, you know, and you get that that feeling. Imagine you felt nothing. Imagine if your beloved walks in, you know, on the arm of your arch nemesis, you know, and, and think of, I mean, your blood pressure goes up just thinking about it. But now imagine if you couldn't feel anything. I mean, you, would, you wouldn't even know that that was your beloved and they wouldn't be because how would you know what love was or that that was your arch nemesis and nothing would matter to you. Everything comes back to emotion. The problem is, the problem is we have learned to think of emotion as being emotional. That narrow band or pitch of emotion is the way that we look at emotion. And so we think that it's, it's subsumed every single thing about the notion of emotion. And when people go, don't get so emotional, calm down. I always want to go, dude, calm is an emotion. <laughs> yeah. It's never a moment that you don't feel an emotion based on what's happening to you, what you're reading, what you're thinking about. Think of this, emotion mainlines meaning because you don't have time. Your thinking brain doesn't have time to figure out what things mean to you analytically all the time. You know, that example that I like to give about, you know, if you're driving down the, you know, the, the freeway and suddenly you see, you know, the red taillights in front of you, if your thinking brain, if you had to reason out what to do, you know, you'd go, oh, look, the red lights, what do those mean? That, that, those are taillights. That means the cars must be slowing down or wait upon further empirical observation. You know, they've actually come to a dead stop and I'm going pretty fast. I think I better put my foot on the, you don't think, I mean, if you, if you had to pause to think that, you know, you'd be impaled in the backseat of the car in front of you before your foot could reach the brake. You get a feeling that then spurs what's known as your cognitive unconscious, which has put all of that together very quickly, the logical reasoning. And, you know, I mean, you know what happens at that moment, your foot is, is, is slamming on the brakes before your conscious brain has had a chance to catch up with what the heck is going on. Yeah. Emotion is the driver of anything. Yes, logic matters. It's not like it doesn't. And it's not like once you feel something, you inherently do it. The, the example I always give is like, you know, <laughs> it's like, I think of myself and I think, you know, <clears throat> you know, if, if I, you know, have a, it's midnight and I'm starving and there's this chocolate cake down in my kitchen. <clears throat> Am I going to go and eat it? I feel like eating it, but like, no, I'm going to stop and I'm going to think, and I'm going to go, well, you know, I'm trying to eat healthy and <laughs> There's no website that says the way to eat healthy is to eat an entire chocolate cake at midnight. Like I've searched for that info on every even <laughs> websites and nobody actually unfortunately says that, you know, and I baked it for my daughter's birthday tomorrow. And so I guess I'm not going to eat the cake, but it wasn't the logical reasoning that made me not eat it. It was because if I ate it, it'd make me feel bad. It all comes back to how we feel. Emotion is the barometer. Yes, there's a balance between logic and emotion, but emotion is the decider, always. Feeling is the decider. It's our barometer. Think of feeling as a barometer for meaning. That's why, again, if you couldn't feel emotion, nothing has meaning. And if nothing has meaning, you can't make a decision. Yeah. Emotion is what keeps you alive. So to vilify it and to say it's logic by itself, because again, the irony is, is when you think you've made a logical decision that's based on pure logic, you're hundred percent wrong because you are putting your subjective meaning onto that. And that's what's causing you to make that decision. And subjective meaning isn't, the, it isn't even derived per se from logic. It's derived from your, it's again, it's biology. It's derived from what your brain decided and your limbic system and your amygdala decided was important for you to encode when you were a child in order to be able to survive in the group that you grew up with, meaning at first like your parents yeah. and then the world that you grew up. And that's why your beliefs aren't these factual beliefs that you're looking at. And now you'll look at it in an encyclopedia and get some other factual beliefs in this hate using this word, but trumps that. So now you're going to substitute that. Those beliefs become so deeply encoded in who you are that that's your personal identity. And that's why when you say to somebody, well, that thing you believe here, the opposite is true. And here's the proof. The logical calm part of their brain doesn't go, well, let me take that in and evaluate it. What happens is 
it, it, their their <laughs> their limbic system suddenly you know they they get angry blood rushes to their extremities so they might have to run because they're responding as if those are fighting words they're responding as if you've literally attacked them because you have you've attacked their identity and that is they've they've done you know functional mri studies there was one professor it's always on college students right so yeah. he knew with both groups, what their political beliefs were. And so they were, you know, wired up and he just read them counter arguments, just very, and you know, what lit up in their brain wasn't this calm, let me rash, rationally think about it. It was the part that was like, oh yeah, because we literally respond <clears throat> biologically as if someone has said, put up your dupes. That's, that's biology. There's no way around, it's not like smarter people don't do that. Right. <laughs> it's not We've risen above it. We have not because there's nothing to rise above. It's our biology because as we were talking before to encode that biologically, we're wired to do that and we're wired to live in a world we don't live in anymore. We're wired to the word, you know, that, that now has, you know, it's been, I mean, weaponized is sort of the wrong way to put it, but we talk about now how tribal we are as if that's a very negative thing. And certainly it can be, but indeed, we are tribal because we're wired to be tribal because we're right. wired to live in groups of no more than 150 yeah. so that we're part of that tribe. And if we don't do what we're supposed to do, the whole tribe could fall apart, right? Because we were all working together to get food, to get water, to keep the you know predators at bay. And the thing is in that world where we were wired, it stayed pretty static for millennia. So it was, it made complete biological, logical sense to once that wiring came in, it became, we didn't think of it as our subjective world. We thought of it as the world because right. nothing, there was nothing to challenge it. Yeah. Now yeah. there's so much to challenge it immediately, uh, but our wiring hasn't changed. That, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with us. It just means we're human. Yeah. And I have to say that until I started moving around and when I say moving around, I mean like a lot, probably a, a few people in the armed services have moved around more than me, but uh, the last 15 years um, at one point I, I counted, it was like um, 25 or 30 times. Yeah. Different places where I laid down my head that was not a hotel room. Um, and I, I did not realize how important this idea of tribalism was. This might have even been before Seth Godin's book, Tribes, um, mm -hmm. that I was just like, I must find people like me because I'm, I don't belong anywhere. Like, I'm not like them. I'm not like them. And, you know, the first time that I moved to a foreign country, I didn't realize that that's what I was looking for. I needed to find my tribe. And then mm -hmm. I needed to decide, is this this is kind of, this is close to a tribe for me. Like we seem to be, are we similar enough? Like, can I relax and let down my guard and feel safe here in my tribe? It was so interesting. And now I notice it a lot because of, you know, this is the fourth country I've lived in now in Sweden. Wow. Yeah, no, that's exactly true. And that's, I mean, at least with that, you were in a new place where it was very clear, right? <laughs> the line of delineation was very clear. I'm from here and I'm in a completely other country. So at least there's safety in understanding that. Right now, you know, we live cheek and jowl with other people and it isn't delineated that way. So it, it can be even scarier in terms of, both in terms of not necessarily knowing if you can trust other people and also in terms of giving us the false sense of, we all believe the same thing because you right. think that we would. And then, you know, I mean, I mean, I can tell you that just in my own, in my own, in my own business with clients who I've worked with for years, suddenly finding out that they were in a very different tribe than I was, which also sort of lets you know that, that we're more alike than, than different. You know, I mean, there were a couple of people who was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you voted for that person? I can't believe it. You know, and I look back and there was literally nothing in the depth of the way of the empathy they had. For, it was just, it was this one sort of part of it. I, I mean, I, I don't even, I still don't, some of it I still don't understand, but it was great. I mean, the, I guess the difference, because I wear my politics on my sleeve, there's nobody who doesn't know what I believe. So they were being kind to me. <laughs> I think on one level and we're clearly the kind of people that that wasn't going to come at me with a screed the same way I don't do that to other people because I want to understand 
you know, right. I really, wanna, I really want to get the, okay, well, why, well, where does this come from? Because honest, often it comes from somewhere very different. I mean, one example would be that I sort of have in the book is, is here, you know, you see people and they've, they've got, they're very angry at the government and they've got those signs up that say, you know, keep your government hands off my Medicare. And you think, okay, I want to just sit you down and explain to you that Medicare, in fact, is a government program. And if the government took it, you know, but that's not what they're angry about. I mean, that would just make them angrier at me. What they're actually angry about is the fact that the government, they feel that the government takes their hard-earned money and takes it away from them and gives it to people who they think are not worthy. And that's what's unfair. And that goes to a deeper seated thing that goes to un distrust of the government and distrust and, and probably goes down to, as I've heard many people explain to me, one person explained to me, well, look, the way that it works is you take care of your family and that is your sacred duty and everybody else is on their own. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And so why would I have to, you know, and, and, <laughs> you kind of don't know what to say back to that, but that is so deep seated. It literally came from, you know, utter childhood and, and, you know, and, and that's who that person, that's who that particular person was. He believes that down to his core. Yeah. And, you know, nothing I could say could change it, but that was the why. And I'm sure if we went deeper into that, you know, it would be, you know, why and where and how, but that's the lens through which he's been evaluating everything from childhood up to now. And then, you know, as I say, I think that's a misbelief in my world, but then misbeliefs in life bring on, as in a story, bring on other misbeliefs because there's sort of, then there comes the notion that, well, everybody should know that. And so if you can't take care of your family, it's on you. There's something you are doing wrong. And, you know, government can't protect you because they're not that. Therefore, if you need something from the government, it's, it's because you've not lived up to what you've got and you're now you're making it a quote unquote welfare state because you always have the, the possibility of making things work. And if they don't, it's on you. Yeah. Which or meaning, you know, there's no systemic racism, there's no systemic, yeah, I mean, which is, uh, you know, when somebody's world, that's all they've seen, that's the yardstick they use to measure everybody else, which means if you were going to think of a story to try to change that person's life, you couldn't just come at them and tell them that was wrong, because they're not going to listen to you. Yeah. You've got to find another way in, if that was a belief that you were going to try to, to, to open up or change. And let's say that um, we're going to take the first step of not necessarily trying to change the other person, whether, um, so if I'm trying to sell somebody my products or services, at some point, I'm going to want to get them to believe that I can fix the problem that they have always realized or have just now finally begun to realize that they have. But let's say that um, we start with, um, I hesitate to talk too much about politics, but uh, but let's just say we people living shoulder to shoulder, neighbors, um, and one person has had their whole life this belief that you take care of yourself and your family, that's it, everybody else should do the same. And, and they're absolutely clear that that's the way that they know the world works. And let's say that I'm their neighbor, and I'm like, we all take care of each other. That's how we all survive and thrive. That's how the world works. You won't be able to convince me of any other way. So you've got two people who can't be convinced. But one of the things that I got from your book was that if we can at least begin to understand a little bit more about each other, want to understand even, then we can at least empathize enough to figure out how to once again live peaceably with our neighbors. Yeah, ab I think that's absolutely true. And the, the only way in, if you were to try to change someone's mind that way, would perhaps be, and this is just off the top of my head, then we can talk about even some of the stories in the book where they've identified, <laughs> but, but it would really be to figure out a place perhaps, and just by asking questions, never by coming at, because people don't listen until they feel heard. Yes, so I loved how you said that in the book. Yeah, it's, it's really important because otherwise you're going to give them your reasons. And anytime you come to anybody, like when you say to your significant other, we have to talk, it's like, yeah, but not now, because already they're thinking of all the things, because that we have to talk means you're doing something I don't like. 
We all know that. So not only are they kind of trying to figure out what that is, but more than that, they're now getting up weaponry to throw back at you with, oh yeah, well, here's what you do. And so no good ever comes of that. And really it kind of comes down to sometimes with people you know, like that would be just to asking them open-ended questions that go toward, well, what would happen if? or even that would go toward looking at places where they, you know, like when, when people will say, well, I wouldn't take a government handout. And it's like, well, yeah, but when you, you've, you know, <laughs> you've bought your house and you're, you're taking off your taxes for the, the, you know, for the, what well, you're paying an interest, you are in, but some sort of way that really shows so they can come around to it and realize it themselves, because that is always the key. Cause yeah, I mean, once you empathize with each other, then people are willing to listen, but also coming around and coming up with a story where they are the ones who come to the conclusion themselves, as opposed to you telling them it at all. That's the, when you tell them what, what you want them to believe, they're not, if anything, they're gonna come up with some reason why they wouldn't. In fact, it's called the boomerang effect, where when you come up to someone and you say, well, here's a big reason why you shouldn't do what you're doing, as opposed to them going, oh my gosh, you're right. <laughs> they think about it and then they come up with some other new reason as to why they think you're wrong. It just, it just doesn't work. Yeah. But you're looking for something. Let me give you the example if I can, because, and you guys, I have to say to you, this is like, <laughs> as I was saying to Kitty, this is the second interview that I've had about this book. And I don't know if any of you guys have, have, have written a book, but you go so deeply into the weeds when you write it. And, and having a book come out, I, this is a slight digression. Having a book come out is sort of like having a baby, right? I mean, it's like nine months ago, the baby was sort of made, right? It was there. There was nothing else you had to do. You, you'd done what you needed to do. Right? And it's there. And you kind of get used to it. And you get used to being pregnant. But your life kind of goes on like it is. And you're not thinking about it. And then all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute. This baby's going to come out. What am I going to do? Do I have enough stuff? If I, and, and a, the book is like that. It's like, I wrote it and I went deeply into the weeds to do it. And now here I am. And it's like, with the always story, but what was in that? I've never actually talked about that for real. Can I, can I say that? My brain is like going, <laughs> if you want to know what I'm feeling, it's panic basically. <laughs> but this is great because you're talking to writers. So somebody out there is going, oh, thank God. I am not the only one who felt that way last week. It's, it's the difference, as I say, stories, the difference between what you're saying out loud <laughs> and what you're thinking when you say it, because often they're really the opposite. But the story of always and the amazing thing about the story of always that goes toward if you have the right story. And again, when I say story, I don't mean sit down and let me tell you a story. I do not mean that. I am talking about story in its purest form, which is literally the story that we tell ourselves about something out there because we live and breathe story. I mean, story is our story, is the story that informs every single thing we do. And that is our, our uh, template, our, our, our framework that gives meaning to everything else that comes in. It is the context that everything else comes into. And so, so interestingly with always, and when I say we're talking about always, yes, <laughs> we're talking about the company that makes what used to euphemistically be called feminine hygiene products. <laughs> <laughs> talk about a euphemism. <laughs> but yeah, and they did this ad that I'm going to talk about that they did it was a video ad. And in two, they did a, ver a one minute version of it in the 2015 Super Bowl, right? The Super Bowl. <laughs> We're talking about the most raw, raw, you know, you know, male dominated show, you know, of the year. And it was the top rated ad. It was the top rated for empathy and the top rated for what I mean, it was shocking. And it was for, yes, you know, maxi pads. <laughs> you know? So, but how did they do it and what did they do? And so what they did was the company realized that they were losing they were losing customers because when you think about anything that was like for feminine hygiene, you know, your period on that level, the way they've been sold forever is periods are something we don't want to talk about, not in polite society. In fact, we want to pretend that we don't even have like period, what period? You meet the end of the sentence? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right? Nobody, because the only time you ever became aware of, of, of a period is when somebody had an accident. And I think most of us who are female can go, oh God, yeah, I remember that one time because, you know, those things did happen. 
And so the way that these products were always sold was, we're gonna protect you. No one will know you have your period. And that was starting to change. People were starting to not be quite as embarrassed and we need, they needed another way to reach out and to grab this audience. So they, they wanted to make themselves relevant. And they literally said, we wanted a story that was gonna now connect with young women who were, you know, I mean, once you decide what product you're gonna use, especially something like that, you probably do it forever. So you get someone who's, you know, just going through puberty, you got a customer, you know, for, for their reproductive life anyway. So they started looking into what would be relevant. How could they emotionally connect, which was what they were trying to do. And when they said emotionally, they did not mean we're going to worry them or scare them or over the top. They meant make meaning. How can we make them feel that we are relevant to them, that we care about them and that we care about their lives and who they are, not just in terms of getting a period, but who they are as a person. And so they did research and what they discovered was that young girls have a lot of self-confidence as much as boys, but once girls hit puberty, that self-confidence starts to plummet. And by the time they come out of puberty, very few of them, almost none, have come back up to what their pre-puberty self-confidence was. In other words, it just plummets. And the question was, why? What is it that makes that happen? And what can we do? And what they centered on, they go, yeah, because girls get teased and girls get this. And it's always, and girls are said, oh yeah, you do this like a girl. <laughs> and the campaign, you might've heard of it, might be familiar now, it was hashtag like a girl because they realized that that became, it was an insult, right? I mean, it is, there's no way it was not, she throws like a girl, she cries like a girl, she breaks down like a little girl. And once you hear that, you start to take it in, in terms of, oh, I guess it must be true. And by the time you come out of puberty, it's not like this is a, and this is what I call a misbelief. Oh, it's not a misbelief, this is how girls are. This is how it is, and you come out and it inherently means that you're lesser than, because if you do it like a girl, it implies that you are lesser than a boy. So they decided they were gonna do something about that. And the way I break this down in the book, in this book, which mirrors, you know, story genius, you know, and wired for story is simpler, but it goes to the same, it's misbelief. Okay, that was the misbelief that they wanted to counter. And then what was the truth that they wanted to counter it with? And that is that it's absolutely not true. And then what's the realization after that? The realization is, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm not lesser than, society's made me feel this way, but I'm not that. And then transformation, I am changing who I am and the way that they did it, because you don't preach again, they didn't come in and go, you guys, you know, that they're saying this to you, but you're not really that. And why did you even believe it? Because again, by the time girls were that age, they'd already brought it in. So to say to them, what's wrong with you that you believe it is almost like, like a girl, just like a girl, you believed it. It's like, that's not going to work. So they got, um, Lori Greenfield, I think her name is, and she's a documentary filmmaker. She made a wonderful film called Queen of Versailles, if you ever saw that. Anyway, so she came in and she had, it's a, it, the, the, the way that they did the video, it's in a big sound stage, and they brought people in and the way that they did, they just brought in young boys and girls and some were young girls and then teenagers and then a little bit older. And they just said, you know, we're gonna interview you maybe for, a, they, they had no idea what the agenda of the filmmaker was. So, they brought them up and it kind of opens with these two like teenage girls and they go, she just goes, so you've heard the phrase, you know, run like a girl. And she goes, what does that look like? Show me run like a girl. And they start to do it and they do it. These teenage girls do it in this like flippant way. Like they're kind of going like this or they're going running like this or they're like doing their hair. In other words, they're making fun of themselves. They've internalized the joke already. It's like, yeah, I get it. I get what you mean. And yeah, we're girls and this is what we do. And, and then they get these boys because they're being more than run like a girl. They go, what does run like a girl mean? And they kind of go like this. And they go to one boy, they go, what does fight like a girl mean? And he just kind of looks like, what are you talking about? Girls don't fight. And then he's like, you know, like this, like girls don't fight. And they go to this one young boy, you know, show me throw like a girl. And he cocks his arm back and he kind of like, Oops, he goes and it just drops. So <laughs> very clearly, they've really internalized all of this. She doesn't shame them. She doesn't do anything at all. She brings the young, one young boy back and she says to him, 
So when you said, you know, fight like a girl, just, you know, fight like a girl, does that, did you, did you feel like you were, you were insulting girls, you know, insulting your sister? And he said, no, just girls, no, wait. So it was very clear that he got it. Then she got, and I don't know if I'm doing it, I've got to go back and look, I tell you guys, I'm totally, my brain is going, oh my God, is it in that order? <laughs> then she gets much younger girls and says, run like a girl, what does that mean to you? And, and this little girl goes, means run as fast as I can, go ahead, run. So it's very clear. And now the other kids are watching this, you know, so it's very clear that before puberty, run like a girl just means run as fast as you can. What does being a girl have to do with any of it? And then they bring the girls back and they go, when you hear run like a girl, when you hear that expression, what does that mean to you? And this is an older girl now. And she goes, well, I think it means, you know, that you're not as good as they're trying to put you down. They're trying to say you're not as good as someone else. And then they come back and she says, now that you've watched all this, does it change what you're thinking? And they were like, yeah, it, now if I said run like a girl, what would that mean? And this girl just runs, you know, in place. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, but like, a, but the point is, is they were able to say what they believed without being shamed, no shaming whatsoever. They were able to hear the truth from younger kids without anybody saying that was stupid. Then they're brought back. And then, you know, some of them hear, well, this is what I hear when I say it, that you're lesser than, that you're not as good as, you know, and that makes you feel bad about yourself. And then they come back and go, okay, now from that, how have you decided to change? And then they go, wait a minute, it's, you know, it's that. And at that point, I mean, because listen, they had a business agenda. They wanted to sell, you know, maxi pads and stuff. I don't think they make maxi pads. They make some, <laughs> I'm probably getting it totally wrong. <laughs> whatever it was that they, super long, whatever it was. Um, they didn't mention their product once in the ad because they didn't need to. They weren't trying to go, this is better than whatever other brands there are out there. Yeah. They wanted to form some sort of brand allegiance because they had felt one of the things they felt in the beginning was nobody's ever going to share anything with hashtag always because who wants to, you know, I mean, even though we're not embarrassed by our periods anymore, it's still like, there's still the ick factor where you still might not be, why would you even do it? This became massive. I mean, they, it was like 400 times over where they upped their Twitter following and their YouTube following in their by, by having the girls identify with something that was really on their side, that really, it was like, we see the real you, even though society doesn't. We're gonna empower you to take like a girl back. And that was the goal, like a girl. And now just, you know, how great are you as opposed to, no, oh, I throw like a girl or whatever. Yeah. That was. But that was what they did. They went into their story. In other words, they didn't think how can I sell my product? Because this is a mistake that people make when they're trying to sell anything. Even when they're writing a book, it's like, my product is great and I'm gonna tell you how good it is. Nobody cares. I don't care how good you think your product is. I don't care at all. In fact, the fact that you're telling me about it makes me kind of not like you. <laughs> so I'm gonna think about something else. I want you to tell me why it's gonna benefit me. And I don't want you to tell me why it's gonna benefit me in your opinion. I want you to tell me why it's gonna benefit me based on who I am and how it's actually going to help me in my actual life, given what matters to me and why it matters to me. And that's the goal of this book is to help people dive into that because my, my uh, uh, subversive goal here is both to really try to help people understand whether you're writing fiction, nonfiction, or just trying to <clears throat> convince your team not to text and drive, please don't. <laughs> Um, is, 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 is empathy, is yeah. really going in and trying to understand. Because when we try to understand other people, we understand ourselves better. Because when we step out of our shoes, we turn around and can look at ourselves and go, oh my gosh, I didn't know that I even believed that. That's harsh. Because now that I'm in their reality, I realize the way I looked at it was a little bit skewed there. So we do come you know, a little bit closer together. You know, and then the notion of emotion, I think, is so important. It's so, you know, it's so terrifying. I mean, if I could just tell you one anecdote that, that's there in the book about how scared we are of emotion. And this is, this is how deeply scared. And, and, and this is a, a couple, a few years ago, I think it was 2017, the, the August show, 60 Minutes. I, all of you in the States know the CBS show, 60 Minutes, right? It's been on forever. And they decided that they were going to bring on Oprah Winfrey. 
and Oprah Winfrey. Now, who doesn't, I mean, Oprah Winfrey, everybody knows everything. I mean, she's like brilliant. It's like, it's like you want to enlarge your audience, bring in Oprah Winfrey because she is just, she's got that thing writ large. And so they brought her in and I read about it when she left the show. She left the show without ever being on the show. And she said, the reason why she left the show is because she said, I knew it was wrong when the producers told me there was too much emotion in how I say my name. <laughs> and I said to them, she goes, I said to them, well, is there too much emotion in the Oprah part or in the Winfrey part? <laughs> And she said, they wanted me just to squish myself down. And I realized that I just couldn't do that. I couldn't be someone else. And of course, none of us should be. But think about, think about the emotion there. Think about logic. Logic says, if you bring on someone like Oprah Winfrey into your show, it's going to breathe fresh life into it. And she's going to bring to you an audience that is massive. And yet they were so scared of emotion that she she literally walked before she went on. It's, it's ironic because I think his name was Jeff Fahey, the guy who was the head of CBS News at the time said when the announcement that she was gonna be on the show was like, we're bringing on one of the most foremost voices in the industry. And it's like, yeah, I guess he meant that figuratively because surely it didn't seem to mean that literally. And she walked. Now, you know, I mean, I mean, driven by emotion maybe. I and mean, when you think about it, that wasn't a logical decision. That was an emotional decision in, yeah. in a negative sense. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's funny because the people who follow Oprah follow her from a position of emotion. Of course. Um, yeah. But everything is emotion. I mean, the only thing I would say is I have such a hard time with people even talking about emotion because it's so disconnected from what it means. Emotion mainlines meaning. I can't say it strongly enough. It's not something separate. I mean, can we, can it carry us too far in one direction? Well, of course, but that's that narrow band of it. Of course, it's a balance between emotion and, you know, and, and thinking straight and analysis, but they're not enemies. And what drives it is emotion. And at the end of the day, the decider is always emotion. I mean, think of it that way. I'm fond of saying, like, think about the thing that scares you more than anything besides emotion, which is usually the, it's the penultimate fear is people who are emotionless. Like, you know, I always say like, like in those horror movies or whatever, like the guy is coming at you down the thing and he's got dead eyes. Like what's scarier than that? Because then you, then all bets are off and you don't know what someone's going to do. Yeah. Emotion, emotion biologically is there. So we understand what things mean to us and we know what to do about it. It is not separate from meaning. They're not two opposites, rock'em, sock'em robots that are battling each other. They're part of the same thing. They're flip sides of the same coin. But again, the decider is always going to be emotion because without emotion, you couldn't decide. <laughs> it's the point. Right, right. So that you is know, the key thing. It's so funny because while I was reading your book, I was also, uh, I listened to audiobooks a lot of times when I exercise because it's a way to get extra reading in. <laughs> um, so I'm reading your book and in the morning when I'm exercising, I'm listening to Malcolm Gladwell read his book, David and David, sorry, Goliath. David and Goliath. Yeah. And it was so interesting that like at the, I'm reading your book and it's talking about emotion and everything that we do is based on emotion, even if it's the emotion of, I don't want my boss to be mad at me or because I'm hungry or uh, because I want to be promoted or like, it's still, it's all still connected to emotion. And mm -hmm. on, on the other hand, I'm listening to this other book where he's talking about um, some things that uh, during World War II England, and they assumed people were going to be totally distraught um, because of um, the bombs falling like 57 nights in a row mm -hmm. and stuff. But then there was this totally different thing that, ha that happened. They realized that people had a fear of being afraid. But then once they had started surviving night after night after night, they got really courageous and it just changed everything that that um, the experts, you know, were expecting to happen. Right, but and the other thing I think, because I, I had heard that not from Mal Malcolm Gladwell, but somebody used that exact example in the same exact same way you're talking, but for a different reason. And what they said, and I think it goes deeper than I don't want to be afraid, is that we are adaptable and they got used to it. 
and they got used to the fear and they got used to what they could or couldn't do because and i i heard that said recently you know in in terms of talking about what's happened during the pandemic that in the beginning we were terrified and the more that we're used to it and the more that we know what to do, we're not quite as scared. Because I think it goes deeper. I think a lot of it has to do with our adaptability that once something becomes familiar, a lot of those other fears go away because we know how to do it. I mean, and that is the scary thing going the other way, which is when I was saying before that when somebody wants to give you a fact that's gonna change everything in your life and you don't want to, it's because we stick with that comfort zone, that, that sense of identity that we've got because we know how to do it. And people tend to think of comfort zone as it's comfortable and I like it, it's great. You can hit your comfort zone, but you know how to survive within it. And so you stay in it because it's, it's safe. We, we, we tend to think of everything as binary, safe, not safe. And you can be in the most unsafe place, like during the Blitz in London, but it feels safe because you literally know what to do. Okay, this is where the bombs are probably going to fall. This is where I've got to be. We've figured that out. So I don't know that it would be simply, you know, now I, I'm, I've, I've conquered my fear because we don't conquer fear just because we conquer it because we understand something about it. And, you know, and also I think in the Blitz in London, they didn't have a choice. I mean, the same thing that with the pandemic. I mean, I think, so I think it's so interesting about the pandemic, all of the experiments that we never could have done. And I don't just mean biologically, but like, what's it like to work from home? What's it like if everybody's going to suddenly be doing it? There's the social scientists. What a great time to be a social scientist because talk about having a, you don't have a choice moment, yeah. year, two years, however long it's going to be. John and I were watching uh, the new uh, Disney Pixar film, Soul on Disney+. Plus which obviously was meant to be put out in theaters. And yet, uh, because John is a computer animator, special effects guy, he's worked in um, films and video games. Um, he, we always watch all of the credits so he can see, you know, which company did it? Did any of my friends work on this? So we get to the very bottom of, of the credits and it said something to the effect of um, made in Emeryville, California and in hundreds of homes in the Bay Area. <laughs> and I was like, yes, Pixar, I love the way you just like come back in and say, yep, this is how we did it. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> I loved it. Okay, so one thing, um, I could talk to you for hours and hours, but uh, we probably should at some point wrap this up. So let me come to uh, one more question that will be more about um, the people who are listening. When we are, so I have been talking to lots of people about, do you have a newsletter? If not, you need to start one today. Um, I read a quote by Seth Godin that um, you need to have started one three years ago. <laughs> Even if your book's not out, you need one. Um, and a lot of people, the first thing they think of, what in the world am I going to say? Particularly if my book is in it, even yet isn't even out yet. And I'm thinking uh, the other thing that people say is my book is out, but I know I'm not supposed to say buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. So I don't know what to say, but I'm thinking your book story or die was giving me so many ideas for how I could connect people to either small towns or romances, which would connect to one of my series or why I love superheroes, which connects to another one of my series without necessarily saying anything other than PS. Um, I wrote a book like this. If you'd like to check it out, here's the link, but you could just be talking about things that you think the person on the other end would also be equally interested in possibly. Is this a way that you would look at it? I mean, I think that's a great idea. I mean, I would also say, you know, uh, if we're talking about novels, you know, at this point, um, or even memoir, but, but novel as well would be, okay, so what point are you making? Who do you want to reach? How do you want to change the world and go down that particular rabbit hole? But absolutely, I mean, it comes down to, again, you know, as I talk about in story or die, figuring out who your target audience is, who are they really? And the only, the only two, the only two categories that do not count are, is everybody because your target audience cannot be, even if it is everybody, each, 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 shall we say, tribe of that for everybody is going to have a different reason why they're going to be interested in you. And the other answer is it's not you. And that goes to, you don't want to put out what would interest you or argue people, you know, on that level, because that's not going to pull people in. But yeah, I would find something that you can say something about that is literally ongoing so that you're giving them something. Because think about that. People want to get something. Everybody comes to every story tacitly thinking, what am I going to learn here that's going to make it through the night? What will help me make it through the night? So what piece of information, what, 
notion can you give? I would say, because I'm doing this now, um, I happen to, I deeply love Seth Godin. I love him. He blurbed my book. It was the biggest thrill of my life when my editor said, like, you know, who do you want to get to blurb your book? Like, who's, who's your dream person? Like, if you could have anybody, who would it be? And then all the other lists. And I, I, I wrote him back. I used to take a while to think about it, but I wrote him back instantly. Like, my dream person is Seth. I love Seth Godin. And he actually did blurb it, which I'm still, he's still my heart. I love him. He's the only, like, I look forward to every day, the little thing that he has, yeah. his little music. But, but I, I analyze them. I mean, they're so smart. And I, I honestly would say, look at those because he always gives you something that you haven't really thought of before. It's a little thing, he's distilled something brilliant into something small. And what, what, one thing I would love to ask him at one point is, I read it and I always feel like he's on the same side as me. Like, I bet you he's really to the left. I bet you he's really, and I really wonder if people to the right read it and sit, think the same thing. <laughs> like, yeah. like, he doing it in such a way that's really, because I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. And I really wonder that because often I feel like he's talking straight to me. But I would say, if you want to take a look at someone who every day is saying something that gives you a nugget that you can take, take, look at, look at his, you know, follow him. And he's great because he doesn't let you leave comments, which is good because, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, com the only good time for comments is I love reading an article sometimes in the New York Times or Washington Post and then looking at the comments because that's almost more interesting than the article because you get kind of all around, you know, who people are, et cetera. But I would do that and find, you know, if there is some, you know, like you're saying, if it's some particular town or some particular, you know, industry or some particular social justice that you're really interested in, I would go into that and then, you know, give something because it is a hard thing. And I know people say you should have a blog you know, or something immediately. And I think that's tough. I mean, I think with fiction, that's really hard. Um, you know, I mean, and I suppose if you're going to self-publish, you kind of have to. I'm not sure how you would do that because you are sort of selling your book at the end of the day. That's your agenda. That's what you want. And it's, it's hard to get people. I think that's a really hard thing. That's why for me, and I, I know there's a lot, you know, of you guys who, who you know, self-publish. That's why I, I, just me personally, I'm a much bigger believer in traditional publishing because it at least some of that is already is already you know taken care of on that on that level. Because yeah. I honestly, and, and this is where I don't know, I'm an idiot about this. I will say full disclosure, I know nothing about this. I don't know how well having your own website helps you sell a book if you're a novelist, unless you're already yeah. famous. Well, well and I was talking about a newsletter. Right. So like you have access because you you might sell a um, hundred thousand copies of your book on Amazon, but you'll never know to whom. Right. Unless they signed up for your newsletter or like with. That's like, true. Yeah, that's I do. And I rarely send. I should send out way more newsletters than I do. They're hard. Um, but yeah. Yes. If you have a newsletter, then you do know who your who your audience is. But then you better be sending stuff, you know. A, a, a bunch of times. I mean, his thing, I think, is a newsletter. I mean, I think he's signed yeah, up for it. It comes in your email. Yeah, his comes five days a week. Um, right. Yours comes uh, at different times. Other when people's comes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other people, it's once a month or, or once a week. But I was just thinking um, that the idea of telling a story, reaching people that, um, that you think are in your tribe, talking to think, you know, from the perspective of being in the, in the same, um, whatever you, I feel like, um, when people, this is how I feel as a reader too. Uh, there are times when I'm just like, I just feel like I would like this person if I met them, I like yeah. the way they talk or tell a story or write a book or, you know, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, I was liking your books before we ever met. And then I met you and I was like, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking doing it in your newsletter might give people a, that, what should I write about? Well, tell them a story about something, you know, look at it from the perspective of what, what might they need? You know, what, yes. if, if you were, if you were writing for middle grade kids, you could, you could almost take that always commercial and be like, okay, well, one thing is, is that middle grade boys need to 
come to their own conclusion about what is being offensive to the girls in their class. And middle grade girls need to come to their own conclusion based on things that they're reading and hearing and whatever, that they can do anything that boys or anybody else can do. Yeah, I mean, I'll give you an example. I'm literally, um, as when we finish this, my first call today is with a guy who's writing a middle grade uh, historical novel. And, and exactly, if he were to have, I'm going to what you're saying, if he were to have, and he says, it was funny, he said, he said, uh, he said, you know, I'm a nerd and what I love best about this is doing all of this research and finding out all of these really interesting facts that, you know, that, that aren't common knowledge and I want to weave them in. And it's like, okay, if you're going to do a newsletter, I would say to him, do that. Yeah. Find yeah. really interesting little known facts and do one a week, a month, whatever about the, his, the history stuff that kids aren't going to necessarily get or if it's road, it's boring or yes, but, or even put, I mean, what I like to think of also is putting something in a bigger context. You know, um, I was I was just listening to a, there's a brilliant podcast that I like called On the Media that uh, NPR puts out, um, and they were talking this week about um, and I can never pronounce her name, so I'm not going to try. She, they were interviewing a woman who writes both for the Atlantic and for the New York Times, who's brilliant, and she was talking about the way that the media is putting out info about the pandemic, and about the vaccines, and about how I think very sadly, what I'm fond of saying with the, with the media long before anything is the if it bleeds, it leads sort of notion that so much of, oh my God, there's a new strain and the, you know, and the vaccines aren't gonna be as good at. It. And she said, they take things so out of context that it makes you panic. But when you put it into context and then brilliantly, if, you, if any of you guys are worried, look at on the media for this past week, which would have been, I mean, what, what is this? This is like uh, the, the one that second, on. so. Yeah. Yeah, the end of January. Could, yeah. end of, right. It's brilliant. If you're nervous, <laughs> go back and listen to that because she puts it all in context and it makes you feel much better. So anytime you can do anything, anything that's myth busting, anything that's, you know, I, again, it goes back to to circle back around to what we were saying from the beginning is everything that we hear, we fit into a larger story or context. And the problem with the news media sometimes is because if it bleeds, it leads, we're gonna give you the most shocking thing, it comes to you out of context. So it hits you and your, your amygdala, you tense immediately and, and your limbic system is on high alert. You know, I better remember that. And now that goes into long-term memory. But the truth is in actual context, it has a very different meaning and it might mean the opposite of what this is leading you to believe. Yeah. So, you know, again, it goes to the same thing about understanding other people. There's this one thing they might say, but when you understand the context that they're using to give it that meaning, well, now that changes everything. And now it's the context that you want to come and figure out rather than I'm going to argue with you about that one point, because the context is always going to, you know, <laughs> going, to, going, to going to lock out the, th the point that you are in fact trying to, it's not the what, it's the why and the how that really matter, whether you're writing a novel or anything else. So yeah, if you're doing a newsletter, think of, and I, that's why I would say, look at the, people love that thing of here's three things you need to know or three mistakes like you were saying don't write a book this way three mistakes that people three myths that are leading you astray three things that aren't true four things that everybody wishes they knew anything on that level i mean let's, let's face it that's clickbait yeah that's <laughs> like <for> true sure. <laughs> that's true oh my goodness okay awesome stuff i love this book i love that you have um you call it a story tool several times in every chapter. Um, you have exercises that really, really, by the way, helpful um, as a business person, as an entrepreneur, I've been working through them. They're very challenging, but in a way that I'm like, oh, this is totally going to help me like connect with my uh, customers and my potential new customers. So hey, yeah, lots of good stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's the only thing I'd like to say is about the book, it is prescriptive the way that Story Genius is prescriptive. That it really, first ta first part takes you through the brain science so you really have a real understanding of how and why. And then the second part takes you into the, okay, how do you find your target audience? And once you've done, how do you figure out what that misbelief is that as far as they're concerned would be keeping them from hearing what you want to say, you know, and, you know, 
first and the first finding that target audience because often and then really figuring out what it is you want to ask them to do so that is a very specific thing so once we've done that and that's several chapters and really going into how to dig down and find out what that misbelief is what the real reason why they're not doing what you what you are hoping that they will do as opposed to the reason that they might tell you or the reason that as far as you're concerned might seem obvious both of those things might 100% not be true. So it's how to do that. And it's again, step by step with, you know, after each chapter, okay, now these are the takeaways and this is what to do. And then the last part of the book, as with Story Genius, is okay, here's how now to create a story in story form that might challenge someone's misbelief and have them hear a year. And it goes step by step through, I create a story. And the goal for the reader is to create your own story, not based on what the story I'm creating, but for, you know, the, your audience and your point that you want to make. So it's, it's, it's prescriptive in that way. It's not theory because the, the trouble with theory, and I loved my first book, Wired for Story, and it does have things to do, but it is more theory. And that's why I wrote Story Genius, because it's like, how do I do this? And I'm like, okay, well, this is how this book has, you know, has both. The theory obviously has to be there as well, but it digs into it digs into how and then walks you through it. So at the end of the day, you've created something on your own and you're not left with, you see what you're saying, but I have no idea how to do that. And the last thing I'll say, if you don't mind, my yeah. last, I have had several people read it who who are writers, you know, who are, who are, who are my tribe writers. Um, and, and, and the feedback that I got back was, this is really interesting and it's helping me with my fiction also, because, you know, it's, it's the same principles, obviously, because story is story, but just sometimes hearing it a different way really gives me more depth into it. And it's like, I get it again in an even deeper way. So, you know, for whatever that, for whatever that's worth, um, you know, that, that, that's what I've heard. Yeah. And I, I totally would agree with it. I'm really, really loving this book. Yay. Yay. And at the time that this episode comes out, your book just came out two days ago. Congratulations. Yay. And with this one, as opposed to the others, they are bringing out an audio version of it at the same time. Ooh. So the audio book is, is going to be published also on the 2nd of March. So there you go. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So then people can uh, listen to the audio, read the ebook or buy the paperback. Absolutely. Excellent. So in general, uh, aside from, uh, or in addition to um, all the stores that people tend to want to shop on anyway, where can people find you and your books? Thank you. You know, all the usual suspects when it comes to buying it out there in the world. And you can find me um, at my website, which is just wiredforstory.com. Uh, I'm also on Twitter at just Lisa Cron. Uh, but just to say, you know, full disclosure, I am also very political on Twitter. <laughs> so it's not, I am not one of those people that believes you just have to be neutral everywhere. I will never be neutral, neutral anywhere because I feel like it's very important to, to put your own, and I don't like using this to put your truth out there, not in a screed ever, never in a screed, but, but to stand up for what you believe in. I, I, yeah. I believe in not standing up for what you believe in when you believe something really strongly, it's important to be out there because then the same way with writers, the same way, if I could just say this one thing, there's something that killed me in when I would teach, you know, at UCLA or wherever, and people would come in and they'd go, what we've been taught when we're workshopping is, you know, when someone's critiquing your work, shh, don't say anything, just listen. Worst advice ever never it is it is i cannot begin to tell you how 100% i'll never do that because it's got to be a dialogue if someone says i was reading it and i not, not, what that really means is don't be defensive absolutely if someone says this wasn't this don't argue and tell them that it was if they say this wasn't there don't go no on page 32 it was actually there but if it's not a dialogue it's completely worthless because first of all you don't really know what they mean when they give you feedback you have to be able to ask. And if they say, well, I thought you meant blah, blah, blah here. And if you can't say back, well, no, what I was trying to get across was it, it must be a dialogue. And the same thing is true with putting your beliefs out there. It's a dialogue. Yeah. I don't put my beliefs out there because I want you to believe this or else. I want you to know what they are. So if you have a really good counter argument, <laughs> so to speak, I want to hear what that is. And I want to try to at least be someone you know, who can, who can hear and take it in and then say either yes, but, or wow, I never thought of it that way. 
Yeah. And what a great example of story, because one of the stories that we tell ourselves about other people, when we read something that we disagree with, um, or at least I'm speaking for myself, sometimes I'm thinking you are purposely just trying to piss me off. You probably don't even believe that. And yet I know that that's just my story, but you know, just listening to you say that you got to stand up for what you believe in. And then I'm like, Oh, okay. If I thought that this person was just standing up for what they believe in and they really believed it. Like it would just make me think about the argument, the whatever differently from, I bet you just wrote that just to start a Twitter war, you know? Right. Right. Which isn't to say there aren't people out there doing exactly that, but but read people, you know, and there are a lot of people that if you, if you, I I had that in in the beginning a lot where I just say, I just want to understand what just, you know, let's just talk about it so I can understand. And then you get a screed back and it's like, okay, you know, no, no point in that. Once you get a screed back, it's, it's, it's over. That's the other thing I would say to people, when you get a screed back, it means stop. Because I know so many people that drive themselves, one person I'm thinking of in particular, who drives himself insane, always coming back and arguing. And it's like, life is too short. You've got to stop. There's, you're never going to get through and you're going to give yourself a heart attack. Yeah. You have to, and now you're, it's like, you're, you're wasting your life and your time when you could be doing something to change the world in the way that you want to see, as opposed to letting somebody make you this angry. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love this. I love talking to you about all this stuff. And it's so interesting uh, and so applicable to our current daily life, as well as our writing business, as well as the fiction or nonfiction stories that we're writing right now. Indeed. Indeed. Yes. Great. Lisa, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. My utter pleasure. If I could leave people with one thing, it would just be, you really do want to understand and master the power of story because those who don't understand it end up being manipulated by it because story is something that literally we are wired for and you're being affected by stories every minute of every day whether you're aware of it or not and being aware of it is the one thing that can allow you perhaps not to fall down some of those rabbit holes that 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 all of us are capable of falling down. And once you've got the power of story, use it wisely.